And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Revelation of Jesus Christ. No, oh. but but it is a four. Oh, yeah. yeah. Four messages to four churches. And chapter three. three messages to three churches. Chapter. Four is the four living creatures, as well as the 24 elders. Chapter 5 is the scroll with the seven seals on it, and Christ is worthy to open it. Chapter 6, where we are now, is about the six seals, not all seven, just six of them. And we are down in our studies this evening to the sixth out of six, and that's at verse 12. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12. Have I turned this thing on yet? It's on. Okay, we're ready to go. The great earthquake. Verse 12, I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. There are several earthquakes in the book of Revelation. There's an earthquake when the seventh seal is broken. This one is the sixth seal, but when the seventh seal is broken, there's an earthquake. We'll read about that, Revelation 8, 5. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it to the earth, and there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. That's the seventh seal being broken. When the seventh trumpet is about to sound, just before it sounds, Revelation 11:13, and in that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. When the seventh trumpet sounded, Revelation 11:19. This one was when the seventh trumpet was about to sound. That's in 8:5, but in, I'm sorry, that's in 11:13. But when it has sounded, 11:19, and the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened. And the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple, and there were flashes of lightning, and sounds, and peals of thunder, and an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. There was another earthquake when the seventh bowl was poured out. Revelation 16, 18. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there was a great earthquake such as there had not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it and so mighty. And the questions that uh, are raised by those who study such things are, are we talking literal earthquakes, or are we talking figurative earthquakes? Arguing for figurative events, they're tied, they say, to events in the sky which are difficult to take literally. They'd be looking at the, all the stars falling from the sky to the earth, and they'd say, that's difficult to take literally. And they would say, writers in the second century, in other words, early in the church, they took these things as being figurative. That's the second argument. Third one, no, not a third one. However, <laughs> the events said to be the meaning 
the convulsions among the nations are described literally in verses 15 and 16. And I don't think we have any example of something being described both literally and figuratively. So if these are figurative earthquakes, and they mean the same thing as the literal thing afterwards, that would be totally unique and unparalleled in the scriptures. In Matthew 24, 7, Jesus describes earthquake at this time in literal terms. There's no issue of him dealing figuratively there. There's much that's figurative in the book of Revelation, and it tempts people to make a lot of things figurative, which not, are not necessarily figurative. Only a little a literal earthquake would produce the effect on men that the, these earthquakes produced. In other words, the, the, uh, the kinds of things that they usually offer as a meaning of the figure, if it's figurative, would not produce the effects that we see these earthquakes have. And in Matthew 24, 7, no, I'm, we already looked at that. Jesus describes earthquakes in literal terms. Okay, so I'm going to say these are literal earthquakes. These are shaking of the earth. Next question to answer concerning this is, could this be the final earthquake? There is a final earthquake amongst the things that happen at the end of the bold judgments. In Revelation 16, 18, and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake such as there had not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. Uh, some people say this earthquake may just be another description of the final earthquake. Some people explain the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments as being repetitions. They see patterns between what happened when the seals were opened, what happened when the trumpet sounded, and what happened when the bowls were poured out. And they say this is just three different ways to describe the same series of events. And they would say this earthquake at the sixth seal is the same as the earthquakes at the seventh trumpet and at the seventh bowl judgment. In each case, these judgments are greater in severity than the earlier parts of whichever series we're talking about. But this ignores the structure. We're specifically told when the seventh seal is opened that it results in seven trumpets. There they are. The se there's no seventh seal if it's not the seven trumpets. That's the structure we have. And when the seventh trumpet sounds, the result is, the seventh trumpet is seven bowls. And uh, if we say these are merely repetitions, we're ignoring that structure, which is clearly there in the book. The final earthquake is such as there had not been since man came to be upon the earth. As bad as this earthquake when the sixth seal is opened is, it's not suggested that it is of that intensity, that it is the worst ever. Whereas it is described that way at the, tw at the sixth bowl, or is it the se seventh bowl? So another possibility for interpretation is that earthquakes recur in cycles. Fits the change from seals to trumpets to bulls. Takes John's words literally. The repeating crescendos would tend to give men the maximum uh, impulse and opportunity to repent. Here it comes again. We've seen this before. We know what happens here. Maybe we ought to repent and make ourselves right. Maximum opportunity because of the cycles. If this were the final earthquake, why have the rest of the book? We, we told the story. It's there. It's done. 
And there wouldn't be any seventh seal. This is only the sixth seal. If this is the final earthquake, what about the seventh seal? So that really doesn't fit. One other thing, if this is the final earthquake, men don't have enough time left to seek hiding places. And after this earthquake, that's what they're doing. They're looking for some place to hide. So for all of those reasons, we don't think this is the same earthquake as the end earthquake. God is using earthquakes. He's using them repeatedly, and they are literal earthquakes. Next question we want to answer is, can we place this earthquake in relationship to the overall structure of the tribulation? Where does this earthquake under the sixth seal fit in the structure, as we know it from Revelation, of the tribulation? When Jesus spoke of events during the tribulation, Earthquakes are mentioned close to the end of the birth pangs. He talks of the birth pangs, and then the great tribulation follows after that. And he mentions an earthquake in relationship to the birth pangs before the great tribulation. And Jesus spoke of the earthquakes before the abomination of desolation. Now I'd have stop and say a comment or two about some structure. We're just studying through the book of Revelation, but obviously these things bear some relationship to other prophetic passages. And in Daniel chapter 9, I think it's verse 27 and following, we are told about Daniel's 70 weeks. And the mark of the beginning of the 70th, or final week, the last seven years, which is the same as the seven years of the tribulation. The mark of the beginning is a, uh, an agreement that is made between the people of Israel and the Antichrist. It begins, the tribulation begins with an agreement. But then in Matthew, when Jesus speaks of these events, he marks the beginning of the great tribulation, by the, in effect, breaking of that covenant. When the abomination of desolation is uh, installed in the holy place, in the temple, that's the beginning of the great tribulation, or the last three and a half years of the tribulation. So we're really not talking about these things as we go through the book of Revelation. We're just talking about the things we find here. But we should be aware of the fact that these events are, are prophesied elsewhere. The, tri the tribulation as a whole, the seven years, start with a covenant, an agreement. And we think that agreement provides for Israel to be able to build their temple again. And then the middle of the tribulation, or the beginning of the great tribulation, is when the, that, that covenant is broken, and uh, the Antichrist places the abominable image in the temple. Now, what we're looking at here is can we place this earthquake in relationship to other events in the book of, tri tri of Rebel, uh, in the other events in the tribulation? Matthew 24, 7 says, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. Jesus speaks this as he's talking about the preliminary events. These, these are just the first part. It's not the great tribulation yet when he says there will be famines and earthquakes going to be wars. Nation will rise against nation. And as we've looked at these first six seals, what have we seen? We've seen war, and we've seen famine, and we've seen death, and we've seen this earthquake. And Jesus describes all these things as a part of the birth pangs of the tribulation, the first three and a half years.
Then Jesus says he continues after saying there will be earthquakes in verse 7. In verse 15 says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, was, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. And he goes on and describes what they should do at that point. But uh, this first earthquake in Revelation, this is the first one we've come to. There haven't been any earthquakes in the book of Revelation before this. And Jesus described earthquakes before this abomination of desolation was installed. And for that reason, we say this earthquake must be in the first half before the beginning of the really tough time, the great tribulation, the last three and a half of the seven years. The sun and moon are changed in appearance. Verse 12, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. This is the first involvement of things in the sky in the events of the seals. The sun and the moon and the stars are going to be involved here. The darkening of the sun was often predicted in the Old Testament in connection with this time. We're not going to go through all those passages, but there were quite a few. This darkening is like sackcloth. Sackcloth, I think, was goat's hair. And, and it was like what you would think of as a gun. Does anybody know anything about gunny sacks anymore? Oh, sure. Yeah, but you're as old as I am. You're older than I am. Gunny sack, do we know, do you know what a gunny sack is like? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. We've got a few of them here at the church. Do we really? Still around? Yeah, we use them for three-legged races. Three-legged, how useful. Yes. <laughs> Well, they used sackcloth. I don't know what else they may have used it for, but they used it as a sign of mourning. If they were in mourning about something bad that had happened in their lives, they'd dress in sackcloth. It'd be worn over the skin. It wouldn't be very comfortable, and it was a sign that, that they were very sad. Moon appearing as red was another event which was predicted at the end time. Verse 13, Revelation 6:13. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. So the, the figs are still on the tree. They're not ripe yet, but a wind comes along and knocks the figs off. And I guess that must have been a common appearance. I have lived where we had a fig tree, but I've not seen the wind knock the figs off from the tree. Uh, I take it that that would have been something they would have understood. You can get the idea, can't you? I mean, a lot of fruit on the tree, the wind comes along and they're just raining down. I would think of it in terms of the walnut harvest in the Central Valley. Now, we're probably not too familiar with that or, uh, either, but they'll come up and they grab hold of the base of the tree with a machine and they shake it better than you could. And uh, out come the walnuts, and what falls to the ground is uh, raked up, and that's the harvest, and what remains in the tree. I don't think they bother with those. I think they're all done when they get done shaking the tree. But God says here, the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind, and the sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up. Now, an earthquake is one thing. Stars falling from the sky is something quite different. And the thing that really helped me understand this one is that the word that's translated stars here at that time meant anything that appeared from the earth to be smaller than the sun or the moon. We look up from here, and the sun and the moon are the big things. And the rest of it is all kind of little points of light. So they would refer to what we call comets or meteors as using this term, stars. This term is used to describe the star 
the Magi followed when they were coming from the east when Christ was born. I don't think that was a star as we think of a star. Why not? It, it changed direction. Stars pretty much stay in a steady stream right straight across the sky because we're looking at them as the earth rotates. But this one came to Jerusalem and then went south to Bethlehem. And it was specific enough that they said, oh, it's going that way. I don't think that was a star. I don't think something four light years or further out in the sky made that kind of a motion to direct them to go down to Bethlehem. I think it was some sort of a comet or meteor that God prepared. I don't think it was anything you'd see in nature today, today at all. But uh, that just is another context for the use of this term when it's not talking about one of the stars. What would happen to the earth if, if one of the stars hit us? That would be the end, wouldn't it? You wouldn't need any seventh. You wouldn't need any set of trumpets. You wouldn't need any bowls. And if it was a whole bunch of stars, I don't think you could find the earth. I think it would be obliterated and gone. So I don't think God is talking about stars. I think he's talking about comets. Would that be terrifying, you think? It would be terrifying right now, wouldn't it? I mean, if there... A meteor shower is nice if you're going out in the middle of the night to see the light. If they are hitting the ground all over the place, I mean, we, we've got some, some big cavities that they say were caused by a meteor years back, and they can be miles across and many feet deep. And if you had uh, a lot of those hitting at the same time, I think that'd be terrifying. And I think that's the point of the sixth seal. It is terrifying. Dr. Robert Thomas has translated here, heaven was separated into parts as a scroll being rolled up. And then he comments, the divided portions will shrivel, curl up like paper, and form a roll on either hand. So these things are not hitting the earth, but these are the stars of the sky that we think of as stars. And they're being rolled up like a scroll and leaving a dark place in the sky. If you saw that happening, would you think things were getting serious? That, that, would, be, that would be horrifying. Being without the Lord and seeing something like that. And apparently that's the way that men will see this action. And it's not the end, but it'll certainly seem like the end. Isaiah 34, 4 says, And all the host of heaven will wear away, and the sky will be rolled up like a scroll. All their hosts will also wither away as a leaf withers from the vine, or as one withers from the fig tree. If your universe is falling apart, it's all over. And that's what they're seeing. The real end, however, does not come until Revelation 20, verse 11, which says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence the earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. So it's all over then. No place is found for them. But they're just moved around in a very drastic way under the sixth seal. Then continuing with Revelation 6, 14, And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Every mountain and island were moved out of their places. That could be the result of a really major worldwide earthquake moving things around. What else could cause that? Volcanic activity. As the magma comes up and things are being shoved around up here. How about plate teutonics? Do I, did I pronounce that right? Tectonics, teutonics? Do you know what I'm talking about? 
tectonics maybe. There can be tsunamis too. Yeah, tsunamis maybe, sure. So uh, this movement doesn't terminate the mountains, but it moves them around. We're familiar with mountains that stay put. And again, this would be terrifying like the stars. These mountains are moved around, but it's not the end because chapter 16, we're in chapter 6, this is 10 chapters later, and every island fled away and the mountains were not found. Now, they may have been moved around earlier, but when you get to chapter 16, they're gone. They did. God didn't cause them to disappear this time. He just moved them around a little bit. Not a big thing for God, right? But it's a big thing for us if the mountains start moving around in the islands. So men try to hide in caves and under mountains. The kings of the earth, verse 15, and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. Every category of man, we have seven categories here. Every category of man seeks refuge from God. Hid themselves, and we're going to see what they said as we read on later, but kings, highest administrators, the highest authorities in all the lands. Great men are the officials. This is like the cabinet of the president. This, uh, this is the administrators that are high-level officials in the administration. The commanders are the military officers. This word refers to a commander over a thousand men. It wasn't always a thousand, but the word includes the word thousand plus some more. And uh, nations went to battle under the direction of commanders, and the direction and future of the nation depended upon what these commanders did. World War II, the future of the United States of America was on the shoulders of a commander. His name was Eisenhower. And the decisions he made and the things that he did resulted in a drastic difference for the future of Germany and the future of Russia and the future of the United States. These are powerful people that we're talking about. The rich. Now the rich control some things too, don't they? They control commerce. We're not going to comment on the election. No, no, no. no we don't want to do that. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they have sometimes quite an influence on public policy, don't they? They're able to spend money on people who will influence what legislation is passed and what is not passed. So we're talking about first five categories of men we're talking about here are all very powerful people. And then we have two categories not powerful at all, slaves and free men. At that time there were so many slaves that that was a real division. It wasn't like almost everybody was free and there were some slaves. There were many, many, many slaves. In the Roman Empire, it was not considered honorable to do physical work. You had slaves to do that. So men would hire, no hire, they would buy slaves. And those slaves would be the teachers for their children. And they would be the stewards of their households. And they would be in charge of the manufacturing. They would do all that work because free men didn't do that. And as a consequence, when it talks about slaves and free men, we're talking about two major divisions of those who are relatively without power. So they're all doing the same thing. Doesn't make any difference if you're the king or the general or the slave. 
They're all looking for a mountain to fall on them and take care of their problem. Could we say they're scared witless? Didn't make a lot of sense to say, uh, I need for a mountain to fall on me and hide me. But they're thinking of this in terms of the wrath of the Lamb. Verse 16, and they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. This is the world. This is the unbelievers. This, these are the people that are not following Jesus Christ. And they know where these things are coming from. Now, you know, when it was the guy on the white horse and they were setting up peace, they thought, on earth, uh, they probably didn't have a clue where that was coming from. And, and then when, when the uh, war broke out, they probably didn't think that was God. They probably just thought, you know, hey, this is really bad. We're having bad wars here. And then the famines hit, and they said, well, yeah, we had wars, and, and now we've got famines. And, and then they had everybody against his neighbor. You know violence is greatly increasing in our land today. Nobody's saying God's doing it. They're, they're not repenting. They're not calling on the mountains to fall on them. But... Uh, so I can imagine when these things happen at this later date, they might still be kind of cool at that time. But when the earthquake quakes and the mountains and the islands all move out of their places and the comets and meteors come in huge showers that actually strike the earth and when the sun is darkened and the moon turns red and... and <laughs> When all these things happen, all of a sudden they get a clue. And they say, this is the wrath. Do they know about the wrath of God? Everybody has this idea of apocalyptic events. Apocalyptic events are, comes from the idea of the apocalypse. The apocalypse is told, uh, we're told about that where? Book of Revelation. And these folks know about these things. If you talk about apocalyptic events, most people in our society would know what you're talking about. And when it comes to these events in this future day, these people will look at these things and say, I know what this is. And so they say, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. They've got a concept of God on the throne and the Lamb. And they want to be hidden from that. They would rather have a mountain fall on them than to be subject to the wrath of God. Now, on the one hand, that, that's, that's pretty intelligent. Because I'd rather have a mountain fall on me than be subject to the wrath of God. How about you? That would be a really good choice. In their circumstance, not so much. You know, the right response when you see that God is wrathful, they haven't had the mark of the beast yet. Remember, that's going to come later on. Hasn't come yet. God says anybody who has taken the mark of the beast, what? Can't be saved. It's all over for them. These people haven't taken the mark of the beast because it hasn't been given yet. But instead of calling on the Lord and saying, forgive us, save us, they're praying to the mountains and looking for caves under rocks. This has happened at other times, happened in Israel's last days, Hosea 10, verse 8. Also the high places of Avon, the sin of Israel, will be destroyed. Thorn and thistle will grow on their altars. Then they will say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills fall on us. Talking about a historical event when it got to that point when the Assyrians were invading 
Israel back then. And twice in the Old Testament, well, once in the Old Testament, once in the New Testament, this has been prophesied, this event that we're looking at here. In Isaiah 2.19, men will go into caves of the rocks and into holes of the ground before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. Sounds like the sixth seal, doesn't it? When he arises to make the earth tremble. And then Luke 23, verse 30, then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. So there was prophecy concerning this reaction, which really doesn't make any sense. But there was prophecy that this would be their reaction. Men so depraved of mind that instead of calling out to God for mercy, they pray for the mountains to fall on them. Verse 17, For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Has come looks like a perfect tense, the way we've described it for you, but it's actually a past tense here. The great day of their wrath came. The war, the famine, the mass death are part of this wrath. When the judgments reach the sun, moon, and stars, there can't be any doubt. They're looking and they say, that day has come. We made fun of it. We made fun of people who talked about an apocalypse. We made fun of the idea of this ever coming. Now, I'm expanding on the text. You can tell that, right? But can you imagine them saying that? We made fun of these, but this is it. It's here. It, this is really happening. Who's able to stand? This is not who's able to stand before the judgment. That'll come too. But this is who's able to stand in terms of to continue life. They're, they're battling to try to stay with their program. They don't want God's program. They want their way. They want to be able to stand. What are we going to do here? We've already adopted the Antichrist. We've already killed off a lot of the Christians, those troublemakers. What are we going to do to stand now? Who's going to be able to stand? And the implication is not a thing. Not a thing. It's come to the point where God is really going to start cleaning up. And so I think we're getting real close here to the midpoint of the tribulation. The first things, the beginning of the birth pangs, is just about over. And it's closing out with a bang, isn't it? And so we're going to have a little bit of a, of a uh, intermission, not quite. As we go to chapter 7, we will have the 144,000 being sealed and a great multitude seen in heaven after they've been martyred. But we'll get to that next week. Yes, Bonnie? Is this considered the day of the Lord? Don't have a term for this? There are a number of days of the Lord. There was a day of the Lord back in the time of Joel, for example. The day of the Lord is any time that God steps in and interrupts the flow of history. He hasn't just left it alone. But pretty much, you know, the things that are going on in the world today, God is allowing an awful lot of latitude for, for people to do what they want to do. Supreme Court wouldn't make their decision if God wasn't given a lot of latitude. In our Sunday school lesson this morning, God says he considers the judges as, as nothing. Not of any consequence whatsoever. He can wipe that all out, but he's... He's letting it roll. He's letting the world do a lot of what they want to do. But when he steps in and says, okay, we're not going to do this, that's the day of the Lord. The flood was the day of the Lord. The, uh, the Tower of Babel, when God stepped in, that was the day of the Lord. Sodom and Gomorrah, that was the day of the Lord. And this is the day of the Lord. Yes, absolutely. Are there other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Let's pray. Father, as we read history before the events, 
We're so glad. We're so thankful. So thankful that you have saved us. We're so thankful for your love. We're so thankful that we are secure forever. And Father, we just pray that you will move upon our hearts and minds as we study these things that we might become more committed and more knowledge, knowledgeable about the things that are really important. We pray it in Jesus' name. Thank you.